To feel rejected is to feel exiled from the tribe or abandoned. My soul decided was that I'm going to create reasons which looked like asthma, severe food allergies, severe eczema, to not be rejected. You have to pay attention to me. Victimhood becomes a kind of homeostasis for us. If I step into my power, I feel the weight of the responsibility of creating a different narrative. The initiation is actually an expansion. Going in that one lane that you were in, that lane got blown up, completely shattered. And so you can choose to rebuild that lane all narrow and stay in that, or you can choose to build a six lane highway with all the bandwidth and all the capacity to hold. And that takes a lot of work to get to that point. Welcome to the Authentic Man podcast. I am your host, David Chambers. This is a podcast for men who want more and less from life. More deep connection, more emotional intelligence, more self-awareness and more great sex. And less. Less heartache, less conflict, less overthinking and less stress. Creating dating lives, sex lives and relationships that are incredible and authentic. My deepest goal is that you, the listener, can take away what you hear in this podcast and apply it to your life so that you can experience greater happiness, transformational growth, deeper relationships and profound sexual intimacy. I believe that as men, we are capable of so much more depth than we are shown or led to believe. So join me as we get deep into this. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Welcome back to another episode of the Authentic Man Podcast. I'm your host, David Chambers. And today I have a really whirlwind, whirlwind conversation, right? Talking to the wonderful Sam Gibbs Morris, men's coach, facilitator, psychedelic worker, um, really talking about what it looks like to be an uninitiated man. And we really explore the idea of that is does toxic masculinity even exist? Or is it just uninitiated men, uh, un uninitiated men, immature men acting. Is that really what it is? Right. Is that really the, the experience that's, that's happening? So we really talk, dive into that and what that means and, and like what it means to be an uninitiated man and how your life will look like. And we talk a lot about the initiation process, like how the initiation process comes to be, um, what it will look like for you. We talk about what we think is, I think is one of the most powerful initiations for men into growing and expansion, which is, is, is heartbreak. Actually, heartbreak. We talk a lot about that, um, in the episode. We also touched upon this idea of how we create rejection. Um, Sam shares his experience of how he was creating rejection in his own life, in his own relationships, almost as a way of keeping himself safe. And I think that'd be really valuable for, for a lot of you. Um, we talk about victimhood and how we find ourselves stuck in victimhood as well. But a lot of the, the conversation really does center around this idea of the being uninitiated and what it means to go through initiation and the traits and ways of being that an initiated man operates with after he's he's been through initiation so this is a really beautiful conversation that weaves and and dives in ways that are just super natural super conversational and and sam shares his really unique and powerful story as well along the way but you know if you're listening to this um you probably know that you know by this time i'm soon to be going on uh paternity leave actually myself which i'll probably do an episode about probably sometime soon but um after that, I'm going to have some, some, uh, programs coming up. So if a lot of what you hear in this episode feels permanent and important to you and you feeling like you need to go through some form of initiation in the pres presence of men and other men, then do let me know. Drop me an email. Um, cause I've got, like I said, I've got uh, longer term programs, one to one programs, group programs happening. Um, very soon after, after my little baby boy is going to be born. But without further ado, I'll let you jump into the episode. And quickly before we get into the episode, I'll just let you know, me and my partner also are running a wonderful workshop on the 7th of May. It's a Tuesday, 7 p.m., right? 7 p.m. called Making Anxious Avoidant Relationship Work. 
Because what we've seen in a work with our individual clients, me working with men, her working with women, and the couples work that we do is that a lot of us get into these anxious avoidant relationships where one of us is anxious, one of us is avoidant, and really struggle to make the relationship work. And if you've if you've ever read the book Attached, you would think that it's impossible, but it's not. We've worked with many couples who have come into happy, connected, anxious, avoidant relationships and actually helped each other heal some of that kind of dysfunctional way of relating. So in the workshop, we really go through a lot of the tools that we've learned ourselves and we've used ourselves and we help couples with as well as ways in which individually we need to show up differently in a relationship to make it happy healthy loving compassionate and full of communication and great sex welcome back listeners and again i have a wonderful episode for you in store planned well you know You've listened to the intro already, so you know that what it's about, but I, I don't know yet. Because <laughs> as you know, <laughs> the conversation kind of weaves and, and, and jives as it, as it just feels natural to do so. And today I have with me a man who I've been following for a long time. Are you there? And um, I started to see some posts that he's bringing forward, and I thought it was a beautiful topic to bring today, something that hasn't really been talked about. And I'm not going to say what that topic is for a little, a little bit, but we'll jump into him. Um, hello, Sam. How are you doing? I'm great, man. How are you? Um, so great to be here. Thank you so much for this invitation. No, man. Thank you. Thank you for, for accepting. Thank you for being here. It's a real, real pleasure to be talking to you today. Um, I always love to start with, with guests as asking them about their, you know, what it is that they, what, what magic it is they bring to the world and what their journey was to do okay. that. And I know because I've listened to you a little bit and watched a few things and I know that your journey has many weaves and turns in it. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, so what I do is, uh, you know, I, I, I really, it's, it's evolved a lot. And what I've really recently recognized is that I work with families. Um, and I do that through working with the men of the families. And it's, you know, allowing men, allowing men not so much to take responsibility because they're not. It's, it's working with men to get to a place where they can actually receive and accept the, the, you know, the, the responsibility or the, the duty of being that that protector, that provider, that space holder for the for the family unit, and a lot of times it looks like mostly about um, how they hold or receive the feminine energy. So you know what I learned in my journey is um, went through a lot of rejection growing up from from women, and it, it created a big big wound in me that you know every time I would get in a relationship, I would you know I, instead of being rejected, I would create rejectionable things. Mm -hmm. And essentially rejecting myself first, uh, you know, um, protecting myself against that pain. So what I've learned is that um, as men, it really is our responsibility. And it's not a, it's not heavy. It's a, you know, I have a friend of mine, um, he calls it a beautiful burden that, um, you know, as men, we get to create the culture of essentially the, um, the, it starts with our family unit. And then if we have businesses, it goes there. If we have um, bigger, bigger impacts, it goes to the culture that we create, that we carry. Uh, one of my mentors, Preston Smiles, talks about bringing the weather. Uh, do you do you you get to bring the weather to your to your environment? And so that's what I work with men on is really how do they uh, expand their capacity, their range, out out of being rigid, being um, fear driven, insecurity driven into this really spacious, consciously aware, divine masculine um, space holder for the world in front of them and and the world that they desire to the life that they desire to live. Mm, beautiful man thanks beautiful oh man that must be really magical to to see that right to be working through the lens of men into their families almost like for some reason the what comes to my mind is you know when you drop a, a, a drop of ink into water and it it drops in and it's like mm. diffuses through you know you must see the real ripples effect of of the work that yeah. you do yeah yeah one of the one of the examples i like to use is um if you think about a museum um, you know, like a museum, like what, what happens in a museum? People are really like flowy and in touch with their feelings and, and nature and they're interacting and moving throughout all the rooms and essentially a very feminine experience. Mm -hmm. And that museum does not exist without walls and pillars and rooms, which is the masculine structure that holds it all in place and holds the experience of the feminine flow life force which is very translatable to life. I mean, life itself is a feminine life force. And as men, we get to really hold space for that. Yeah. Yeah. Life is always flowing and moving and changing. Never still, never, never consistent, you know, like uh -huh. the weather. 
Yeah, exactly. And if you're not, if you're not like, if you're not ready for it, you don't have the space for it. It feels a lot like chaos. But when you do, it feels a lot like, uh, like you know, you're playing a game. You're just like you're dancing, mm. dancing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, or I imagine like it's like being on a boat, right? If you're on a, if you're on a boat, and it's choppy outside, and you're not really feeling that comfortable being on that boat, it can feel like it's gonna be the end of your life. You're gonna fall off. You're gonna, you know, all sorts of things are gonna happen. But when you feel you're able to kind of ride the waves and and bounce along you you create a sense of feeling around you of ease of comfort and also that um like you said the dance but also the the ever-changing rebalancing and harmonizing yeah absolutely beautiful um and i thought uh, uh this you said something about creating rejection and, and this is i i do a lot of work with men in the the, the, the world of, of dating and rejection the fear of rejection is this uh -huh. thing that's really common for men yeah. right they really have this mm -hmm. this this way of this being the thing that stops them you know and you talked about how yeah. you created i think it was rejectionable circumstances or or, or things i'd love you to dive yeah. a little bit deeper into that yeah a, a great question so um you know I'll preface my uh, <clears throat> my experience of rejection started when I was in in the in my mother's womb, um, and this is again I'll, I'll say this is no fault of hers. This is no I'm not there's no blame here. This is not a, a conscious thing that happened. Uh, but my mom, when she first got pregnant with me for the first couple of weeks, she thought that she was dealing with cancer. She was convinced she had cancer, but it was actually pregnancy with me, and so that immediately like what's you know cancer is like get out of my body reject. Um, and so I had some, you know, it, it wasn't, she wasn't rejecting me. It wasn't, she didn't wish she wasn't pregnant. It was none of that. But the energy that I was receiving for those first couple of weeks of my conception was an energy of rejection. So uh, I came into the world, you know, it, feel, to feel rejected is to feel exiled from the tribe or abandoned. And so what I, my soul decided was that I'm going to uh, create reasons which looked like asthma, severe asthma, severe food allergies, severe eczema. Uh, I, I would choke on my food a lot growing up. I was going to create these reasons to not be rejected. You have to pay attention to me. You can't reject me. And so later on in life, um, you know, it, it got haywire in relationships because um, it, I would create the same things in the relationship that was that were you know kind of towing that line between is it too much? Are you going to leave me? And are you going to be, is it going to be create more engagement, uh, AKA love what my, my cells, my nervous system thought. And so I started to think I started that the program in me got installed that, um, very early on, like, and there was no lack of love in my house. There was no abuse. There was no verbal, physical, sexual abuse. It was a very loving household. And I noticed that when I was having a severe asthma attack or allergic reaction to food, the attention was a little bit heightened, um, cause it had to be. And so I made up that like that's how I receive love. Like oh, like the 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 baseline love of calm, peace, happiness. That's great and all, but you know, for me it was uh, I need a little more. And so I would create these these things that um, you know, as a kid, your parents like my parents didn't choose to reject me. They chose to pay more attention to me. So I learned um, that the more struggle I was in, the more attention I got, the more love I got. And so uh, going forward into relationships, I would create scenarios um, to, to reenact that, you know, like the, the baseline, peaceful, happy love, which, you know, I'm experiencing now, but it, for years it was, I'm going to create a little something extra here, a little extra something. So you, you're forced to kind of save me, pay attention to me. Um, and, um, and that all led to being rejected. And so looking back now, I know subconsciously I was, I was providing a, instead of being rejected just for who I am, instead of you just breaking up with me because I showed up, I was great, I was a good man, I showed up as a good boyfriend, a good husband, whatever it was, and you left me, no, no, I'm going to need a fallback. I'm going to need, oh, you left me because I did that. You le oh, I see why you left me because I did that. And it was creating this reason for rejection without, b before the rejection was actually happening. And so, um, you know, that on the that's a subconscious thing on the conscious side it's a rejection wound i get rejected a lot you know in high school um you know all my friends were dating and and having sex and and kissing girls and and i was not it was just not 
the 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 feminine and I the there was rejection happening. You know, I wasn't it wasn't something that was happening for me. So I, you know, made up that I was broken. I made up that that I was rejected. That um, you know, I'm not worthy. Like a shame creeped in. Like a lot of things crept in from these this feeling of rejection. And I think as men, one of the th- one of the like we are the we're kind of like we're, the, the, let's keep it in relationships. Like we ask the girl out. We ask the girl to dance. We ask the girl like we go up to the girl and talk to her. So inherently built into our structure, our DNA, our role is more opportunity for rejection. And so that, that then inflates the wound of rejection because it's, it happens a lot more to guys. You know, girls saying no when you're 13 is, it's, it's heartbreaking. It's, it's like my life is over, you know, that moment. And so we, we, we carry this trepidation in this, like this kind of, what it does is it, our radar gets so heightened for rejection that once we see, if we see it coming, if we see one little thing for me, if I saw one little thing going wrong in a relationship, maybe like three months in, I'm like, Oh crap, it's coming. I better create a reason now. Either I'm going to create a reason for her to like re-engage or I'm going to create a reason, a reason for her to leave me because outside of just because I'm not good enough. Yeah. Yeah. And that, and that, that led to, and it's the uh, irony of the whole thing is that it all led to more rejection and heartbreak. Trying to avoid it led to more of it. <laughs> mm, mm. And that last bit you said there is like the creating of rejection. It's almost as a, a safety mechanism, right? If I, if you yeah. reject me before you really get to know me or I let you get too close, then that stops my heart from being hurt. That stops me from having to be open with who I am and, and share and bear my soul. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, it, it, it may be, it may be there. And as I'm talking about this, like I recognize too, that, um, you know, maybe I'm not in that, maybe if I'm not feeling the relationship or if I feel unsafe in the relationship, but I don't want to break up with her, you know, it, it takes the decision of breaking up off of my, off of my plate. It ta- it so like, therefore then I get to be the victim essentially. So it, it perpetuates the victimhood that comes along with, you know, victimhood is a very, very tricky thing because we can sit here and talk about how bad it is and how terrible it is. Yet I, I've never talked to a human that if you ask them on their deep, deep heart level, like, how does it feel to be a victim? Like, honestly, it feels kind of good. But there's a part of it that like, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't feel good. I'm not saying that it does and we shouldn't be in victim. It's, it doesn't serve any purpose at all. And we get a lot from it. We get attention. We get gifts. We get uh, affection. We get sympathy. We get compassion. We get, there's a lot of payoff for being a victim. And so, you know, before, like before doing all the work I've done, it was very, very subconscious that I was just like, I just love being in my little warm victim blanket. Mm -hmm. And it's a, that, that victimhood can be, it becomes a kind of uh, homeostasis for us. It's like, oh, this is what I'm used to. When we yeah. step into our responsibility mm-hmm. and power, if we're not used to being there, we'll experience the strange sensation of being like, ah, when I'm a victim, I get all this attention. I get all this like love, quote unquote attention really is just a form of love for us. I get all this love. Yep. And I feel though it's uncomfortable, I feel safe because I'm used to this. It's um, familiar. But if I step into mm-hmm. my power, I step into empowerment and, yeah. and responsibility. I feel this kind of double whammy of like fear, uncertainty, um, unfamiliarity, but also then the weight of the responsibility of creating a different narrative and different, um, experience for ourselves. Yeah. It's that, it's that attachment to the, the familiar hell versus the unfamiliar heaven. You know, our ego, our nervous system will, will always pick without proper guidance and work. will always pick the familiar hell because that ego thinks that's safe as the, you know, it's, it's not, it's hell and heaven. Okay. But it's familiar and unfamiliar. Familiar is all the ego wants because it's predictable. It's safe. It's survival mode. Unfamiliar is like, well, I don't know. Like that could be very dangerous. Like there's a lot of pain there. So it's, you know, the, the work really is to create the space in the nervous system capacity to say, okay, I'm, I'm okay with unfamiliar. I I can be safe in the unknown. Mm. Yeah. And then get the ego on the team. Mm. Yeah. And yeah. And I I feel that kind of leads us into, um, one of the questions on the topics we're going to talk about was this idea of the, um, uninitiated masculine that we have that's running around Mm -hmm. the world. 
um and what piqued my interest was it was a post you did and you talked about um and it's something that i've 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 proposed before maybe just in slightly different words is that it's not that we have toxic masculinity it's that we have this uninitiated masculinity that's been running rampant for decades centuries yeah. eons um yeah what was the, the what was the question there <laughs> um <laughs> It's gone now. Now we're back. The question that that what what if we expand on what that is this this idea of that there's no toxic masculinity, but in fact we have this uninitiated yeah. masculinity that's running rampant. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah, <clears throat> I think that that's the differentiator. There is you know for a while you know five maybe in ten years ago or so like that toxic masculinity was a hot topic. It was a buzzword, and people are always talking about it. And then over time you recognize after you do some work on it. Um, you recognize that it's not the the masculine himself is not the toxic part. Um, even the word toxic is not really that accurate. Is it destructive? Yes. Is it hurtful? Yes. Is it dangerous? Absolutely. Uh, but but toxic is not the right word for it. It's simply a man running around uh, with open wounds, open emotional loops, traumas, um, programs, then kind of essentially bleeding all over the people around him. And, uh, you know, every man, uh, every human really, but, you know, we're talking about men here is that, um, there's an initiation that happens at some point, um, you know, and it, it could be twenties, it could be early thirties. Some people it's a little later. I mean, you, you can bring in the astrology, the Chiron return, Saturn returns, the, uh, the Chiron and all that stuff. And there's a point in a man's life when something's going to happen. Um, and the, the common ones are. Uh, birth of a child, uh, death of a parent, death of a father, um, things like that that you know are are pretty much a like part of a normal existence. Then there's other ones that come in that are you know death of a sibling or death of a best friend or uh, you know addiction, which was mine. Um, you know there's there's all these ways that a man will get um, initiated, which in the time in the moment it, it's awful. It feels terrible. It's it's uncomfortable. It's painful. It's, it's, uh, it's, it creates a lot of things to unwind and unravel and it's a massive up level on the other side of it. Um, I found that usually this initiation happens sometime, maybe late twenties, early thirties, maybe mid thirties, but like 27 to 35 is usually a time when, you know, the, the Jesus here is in there, the 33 that's in there. And there's something that happens that it's really, you know, everyone like 18 or 21 is, you know, kind of the adulthood, like according to society, I, I think it's more like 33. Um, because you really like it, it kind of, you, you get to the point where, you know, you're done with your twenties, which was whatever it looked like. It could have been very good. It could have been very productive. You could have really like gotten into business and, and made, made something of your life and, and made money and gotten a, a wife and kids and all that. Or, um, usually the, the question, the questions be start to come up, uh, you know, around 30, 33, when it's like, who am I? Like, what am I, what am I doing here? Um, you know, you really, you sink into the, the, the real adulthood manhood and, and, and it's going to be an initiation. And so as we move talking about the move from the destructive uninitiated masculine into the initiated masculine, um, you know, the initiation strips, it's, it's a bit like Kali, Kali energy where, you know, it strips away everything that you th maybe thought you needed that you thought was good, uh, but was not serving your actual highest purpose. And so, um, the initiation is this uh, recalibration to the highest timeline, to your actual North Star, what you thought it was. And, and um, you know, it, it means looking, it, it means a lot of times a lot of repair because that, you know, the destructive, the uninitiated, what we used to be known as toxic, creates a lot of damage and, it, you know, burns a lot of bridges and, and it creates a lot of inner turmoil. Like for me, a lot of shame and guilt came through it. Um, and so it's, you know, as, as we, you know, all these, you know, it's kind of like a, like one of those, uh, like coming to Jesus moments where it's like, you know, look, you have to look, what have I been doing for 30 years? Um, you know, does it, is it, is it, is it the right path? Is it my path? Um, and, and so oftentimes like 
for the for some men, you can say, I'm choosing to do this work now. I'm choosing to to say, for me, it was more thrust upon me. It was like, you know, I, I was on this path and I thought things were good and I had a girlfriend and a good job. I was living in Miami, Florida, and all of a sudden just haymaker came in and it was addiction. It was alcohol. And for the next, uh, that was for the next five years was in and out of jails 25 plus times, in and out of rehab seven times, and hospital stays, multiple relationships, uh, inability to hold a job. You know, all these things that I was like, and from what I know now is that I, w- I was kind of refusing to let go of the old and embrace the new. That's a very nice way to put it. But I was, you know, I was fighting. I was fighting my life. I was fighting myself. I was fighting these inner demons that had come in from that, that child that was so sick that never really got a chance to be a child, that never really got a chance to uh, know what love is or know what, um, you know, I, I was in therapy one time and, and the therapist pointed out that, you know, there's a certain point in childhood when you start to get the, the future program, it's called installed, where you actually start thinking about a year from now, six, uh, three years from now. Well, you know, like as you go through like, okay, I'm in high school, where am I going to college? And like, what's, what am I going to major in? My, my uh, existence was day to day. You know, with that with severe, like there was times I've spent um, three weeks in a hospital um, because the outside air was too dangerous with pollen. And, you know, like I, so I had this, like, I didn't really have a chance to have this future program installed. So when it came time to like actually be an adult where, you know, saving money and looking at career path and like all these things, I didn't have that program. And so this initiation for me was a, it was a real um, recalibration into uh, a legacy into, uh, you know, that highest timeline I talked about in the, in the initiation, you can, uh, there's an element of choosing and, um, uh, uh, acceptance of it. And there's also an element of really allowing it to, to unfold. And, and, you know, like it's now it's now we know like there's, there's tons of ways to, to facilitate initiation. Um, and like we, like we talked about father, becoming a father, becoming a husband, um, a parent passing. Uh, now you have things like, um, a friend of mine, Jetty Azuma, he does initiation rites of passage and he takes guys into the woods and there's a bunch of stuff like that. That's that you can go through these programs or a John Wineland program or, you know, like really like deep dive deep into this. Like, what does it mean? What does masculinity mean? What does self, what does self-reliance mean? And all of it really leads to the initiation and there's a massive humbling part of this. You know, like you, what don't you know? You know, like we, we as men like to know things and we like to know how, and we like to know the path, and we like to know the solution and we like to know the completion. You know, it's like this initiation. Part of it is how well can I embrace the unknown and how, how willing am I to seek what's behind my known? Mm. Mm, it's on one hand, when you talk about the initiation, it sounds like an extremely I'm going to use the word painful event in our lives, right? For, for many, it's a painful event. Like you said, the passing of a, of a, a parent or a family member. Um, and even I'm about to become a father in a couple of months. So I'm not going to describe having a baby as oh, having, congratulations. thank you, uh, describe having a child as a painful event, but it is, it will create some level of, of, of pain and as well as joy, but also as an event, which causes us to look at ourselves, to look at ourselves, who we are, how we're acting, our behavior, and also then looking back at who we have been and the impact of that's had on ourselves, um, the world, uh, and the feminine as well, especially as men. I think it's a really important part for us to look at, like our impact on yeah. the feminine. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I think that, like, we, it, for me, it wasn't something that I didn't really asso- associate. Like, I, okay, I'll be, I'll be a good boyfriend or that. But then there's such a bigger picture there. There's such like a, a, a being able to hold that. And that's why, you know, I, I work with men and I, in relationships, really the, the relationship is a, is a big deal. It's, it's, you know, who you, your partner and your, your life and like, it matters a lot. And there are always clues and how you do that is how you do a lot of things in your life. And so as men, like when you said, like, how, do, how, how willing am I to look at all the things? Not just that immediate pain point. The immediate pain point is a symptom, directional marker to something bigger. Mm. Yeah. 
And the way you talk about the uninitiated man in comparison to, because when we talk about toxic masculinity, the word toxic um, in and of itself, it kind of de de describes the person as being bad and wrong. It creates shame. The word toxic creates shame, right? Because mm, if you're yeah. toxic, then yeah. you're bad, you're wrong, you're broken. And in that, I feel that there's this almost lack of compassion and, and, and a lack of compassion for there's a human being underneath there. Even the term, you know, toxic yeah. masculinity is dehumanizing in the many ways that we use phrase of dehumanizing. Whereas the uninitiated man or the uninitiated masculine in a man is from how you're describing it, it's really identifying his underlying, his behaviors may be cruel, toxic, harmful, and have been, you know, from what men have done to the world and to people and to women for, you know, like I said, centuries. But it's recognizing that underneath yeah. that, there is a woundedness. There's a, there's a pain that they've experienced. There's a trauma they've experienced in their own lives that has caused them to act in these ways that are out of alignment with their, with their heart, out of alignment with, um, how their true nature is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, so many good points there. Um, you know, Gabor Mate talks about, he, he, this question he raises is about addiction, but as, you know, it, it substitute addiction with whatever behavior. Um, why the, not, don't ask why the behavior, ask why the mm -hmm. pain. You know, like, and you just talked about it. Like, what what is it? Because I, I, I mean, I've talked to a lot of men that would have been put in the toxic category. I was one of them. And I, I have not met one that does not feel massive guilt and, uh, and honestly confusion about how that behavior like crept in and showed up and how maybe they couldn't stop it. And it's because the, the body is holding on to something that directs that behavior. And as you can try and outthink it, you can try and outsmart it, you can try and out, out mindset it, but until you can get into the actual somatic stuff around it, um, you're not going to free yourself from it. Mm. Mm. And it's interesting, the world is sometimes, and I get this feeling that the world doesn't want to have that much compassion for these sorts of men or us sort of men, right? Who have, like you said, this yeah. been in the states of, of toxic masculinity is almost the dehumanization allows us to look at those men as being cruel and evil and wrong and bad, but actually assumes mm -hmm. that they don't have any feelings about what they've done. Like that, that there's no, as if they, yeah. they don't look back and go, oh shit, I feel bad about that. It's like a way of which if we, cause if we look at someone yeah. as a monster, we can dehumanize them and we can say and treat them in ways that, you know, however we want, right? We can see it through the way that we do war, the way that torture happens and, and the rhetoric in, in the news. And it's interesting that we use this same tactic when we talk about toxic masculinity, right? Because it dehumanizes men mm -hmm. and then we also do that dehumanization we remove the fact that they have feelings which is also something as men we yeah. we kind of grew up with as well right we grow up having our feelings and our emotional body kind of shrunk um numbed withered whatever word you want to use and it can actually be that yeah. that in itself is a traumatic and painful experience that you know almost blanket across especially the western world ma men experience yeah yeah i mean it, it's um you know, we, we're, we're basically, we're told to throw some dirt on it from a very, very early age. And it, it creates the pressure cooker in our bodies. Uh, you know, like, like, you know, and, and, and we get in, in to it, 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 it separates us from the feminine because essentially what that underneath that is don't be like mm -hmm. a girl, you know, don't like, that's kind of like what is being, that's the underlying tone there. And so, it, okay don't be like a girl that means a, a girl's bad like are we bad like are we separate like it, it creates this real like it the you know feeds the patriarchy it feeds like all this hierarchy this all this like domination and whatever whatever then you talked about it like the centuries of oppression that women have felt from men because we've been told to be tougher be stronger be bigger be fat like all the things and um it, it all the while it creates this separation of like, okay, so it's bad to feel my feelings. That means that if a woman has feelings, that might also be bad. And so then we wonder why we get in relationships and a woman starts feeling things and we're like, ah, you know, I, I don't know how to handle this because we don't know how to handle it ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it, we're back to that kind of chaos, right? Is in, we were talking about the beginning yeah. is that then we experience the feminine women as, as chaotic because we've been this kind of numb, 
emotionally shrunken being. So we then experience women, the feminine, as this chaotic ball of feelings and emotions mm -hmm. and responses and reactions and desires and wants and needs and become overwhelmed. And then we fall back into our programming, which we've been taught is domination. So it's like, I need to dominate her. I need to like put walls around her and n n remove the emotions or numb out or cause this situation to become um, what we think is harmonious, but actually is, is numb, like a, a numb relationship. <laughs> it's numb. Yeah. And then in, it's almost, yeah. And like that whole, the, the whole thing about how men love, we love completion and we love solution. Mm -hmm. And that oftentimes is the, the, that kind of thing, like containment, that you talked about that we put on it, we contain it because we, Oh, I know, I know the way out of this. I know how to help you. And, but the feminine is like, but they want to have the experience them. So they want the felt experience. And we're like, Oh God, it's taking forever. And like, all oh, like, it's too much. And <laughs> I, how long are we going to be here? And like, you know, this is the things going on in the masculine body that then. And so this is why it's so important for men to become initiated because then they get to be, be there with the feminine in, in that, like, I'm here, babe, like experience it, free it, scream, yell, cry, whatever you need to do to hit something like do like, just uh, like, I can hear it. I can hold this. And you know, a lot of times it's that like, we talk about mountain energy or, or tree energy of, you know, in the storm, that's a storm. And so if we can just be there holding that storm, then that's when, um, that's when beautiful relationships happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, indeed. Without the containment. And we stop trying to contain and just starting to allow. <laughs> yeah, and being with, like being a participant in the yes. in the chaos instead of trying to be the, you know, the person that's trying to herd cats, <laughs> you know, trying to like control it. <laughs> yeah, mm. yeah, exactly. And what are the traits or what is needed for a man to kind of consciously go from uninitiated into an initiated masculine man. Um, so the, the, so let me, let me just clear it. So you, when you're talking about the process of the, the shift, not so much the, the, the end result, so to speak of a, of initiated man or a conscious man, but like, what's the process like to, get to fill yeah. the gap? Yeah. Um, you know, it is uh, one thing that I've really landed on. The basis of it, I think, is uh, willingness to stay engaged, mm -hmm. to you know, lean in. Um, you know, it's it's easy, and and I will I will I will walk out of the arena. I have walked out of many arenas because I didn't have the capacity at the time, and now I've learned that the longer and the more with more integrity and dignity, I can stay in the arena, my own arena. Um, and then, you know, the arena, like what I do now is I bring men into the arena and hold them in that. But, you know, this process of going from uninitiated to initiated is stepping into the arena and not leaving and being there, being in the, it's, this is the hero's journey, you know, going out and, and going on the, going out onto the, the, the journey and staring your demons in the face, you know, wrestling with those monsters and, uh, the the ability to to and I want to say not look away, but I don't like using negatives. Like it's the ability to keep looking, keep seeing, keep turning over stones, keep keep going. Because I mean, the initiation process once it begins, like there's usually like a huge burst, a huge kind of entry point where it's the addiction or it's the death of a parent or it's the um, heartbreak or whatever it may be. Um, that's usually like that. That'll trigger the big work. Like you're going to really be forced to look at some things and you'll do a lot of clearing. And then going forward, it, it becomes more of like, I am on the initiation path. I, I'm on this journey and I'm willing and I'm, and I'm open to uh, allowing things to come up and allowing stones to show up and me, I'm going to turn them over and I'm going to look and that, that can look like, um, you know, we, we talk about sacred union where like, Sacred Union is the ultimate ceremony. And I imagine you're about to experience a whole new <laughs> ceremony with having a child. Like that's going to be, that's the, that's the, the next level ceremony. And, you know, it, a lot of it is like, look at life like a ceremony. You know, it, it, it is like when you go into ceremony, you're, you're 
intention, my intention is always, I'm here. Like, what do you got? Like, what is in here for me? What else is here? What else is here? And just keep asking. And I think as part of the initiation process, it is never stop asking, never stop looking, never stop um, expanding. You know, I, I, I did a post the other day about uh, contraction versus expansion. In the initiation, you're going to want to contract, pull back. And there's moments for that. There's moments for pauses and there's moments for rest. And when an opportunity presents itself, whether it's extreme success or extreme pain, it's an opportunity for expansion. And that's part of the initiation. The initiation is actually an expansion. Um, you know, cause it, like going, going in that one lane that you were in that, and you got, that lane got blown up, completely shattered. And so yeah, you can choose to rebuild that lane all narrow and, and stay in that, or you can choose to build a, a six lane highway with all the bandwidth and all the capacity to hold. So I think when you talk about like moving from an uninitiated to initiated, it is how willing are you to stay in that fire? Mm -hmm. It's a, I hear that it's like a, um, it's a commitment to the path, you know, because when you, you know, to stay in the kind yeah. of devotion, yeah, devotion It's like when you got, get into the lane and you start to yeah. move, as you said, there's an, there's a, there's like an entry point. I, th I think when you said heartbreak and it just, you know, I, I work with a lot of men that come to me because of heartbreak relationship breakdown or verge mm -hmm. of breakdown or they three the, the number one thing i see on the when the kind of intake form for an introduction call is just like my relationship broke down is either one two three or four months ago and then they start the stuff right but they have to say this relationship <laughs> breakdown is you know yeah. one of the first initiations we experience but in our i'd say probably in our 30s especially often is the most revealing because then we really get to look at some of the patterns and habits but the key is then and what i'm hearing you say is when the the uh entry point event occurs and we are our, our eyes are opened up you know our eyes are opened up our emotional right. bodies are expanded and we feel and it can be overwhelming and we see ourselves or a glimpse into how we have been being is to take the next yeah. step <laughs> instead of trying to take a step back or a step away Mm. Yes. That's it. That's right there. And I I you know, I was I forget what I was reading, but um maybe it was uh do you know Emily Fletcher? No, I don't. Uh she does Ziva meditation. Um she's she's brilliant. And I was listening to a podcast she did with uh on Know Thyself and she was talking about um there's something biological that happens when we take a step forward. So if you like if something that's why like when we say like step in like there's actually something in our DNA, our biology that says when we move forward, we are actually doing something that uh, triggers a, a neural response that says, let's go. We're in, it's an engagement. Whereas like a step to the side or a step back is a disengagement. And so like that could be uh, literal or metaphorical is that, you know, how willing are you to take that step in and not away? Because, mm -hmm when those when that moment comes in this you know the initiation of heartbreak the initiation of of child arriving you yeah. know you know i think back to when i say child being born is is the amount of men that in that moment they they see the baby and they're terrified right they feel the weight of the responsibility of mm -hmm. the baby for the rest of their lives and they withdraw and they they yeah. leave you know there's probably a certain percentage of men that leave the the relationship within six months to a year of a baby being born right and it's yep. that's the step 67 67 <laughs> wow of, of their marriages end in the first year of a baby being wow born. that's incredible yeah okay so my guess was about yeah. right and that's that <laughs> stepping away that's that sidestep of like oh this initiation right here yeah is gonna maybe they don't consciously know at that moment this is going to take me to a, a higher level of being a high level of expansion as a man a, a greater capacity and in that moment, they're like, what they experience is overwhelm, right? Or the emotions of that moment being too much and being like, I'm getting, I, I can't do this. You know, I need to step away for whatever reason. And what I'm hearing you say is that the, the key thing there is to, at that moment, have built up enough awareness to know that, ah, I can do this. Or the next thing I did, I can keep taking steps forward in this. Yeah. That's, and that's the, that, that moment when you're like, when that guy wants to like pull back is 
if you have if you have the awareness or that moment of pause to say this feels like too much and it's also going and i know that it's it's going to expand me and i can either if i step away i'm letting the too much win i'm letting the overwhelm win i'm letting the fear win whereas if i step in i'm stepping into that new timeline that higher highest evolution of myself and if you and talking about heartbreak the blast so that I had a big initiation with addiction and, and, you know, age probably from age 23 to 38, 15 or so years of it. Um, 33 was when it really shifted. But uh, the last two, I, I kind of like smaller initiations, but, but also very, very big initiations have been through heartbreak 2019. And then um, last year um, just like, just completely shattered my entire world. And it was like, wow, like actually thank you because I was not on the path that those, the reason those things fell apart is because I got it. I had gotten off of my alignment. I got out of alignment. I had lost my way. And, um, the one in 2019, I remember, I, I don't remember where I was, but I saw a quote and it said, if it broke your heart and it opened your eyes, that's a mm. win. And that's it. Like if we can allow things to open our eyes, that that's a win. We're, win we're, we're allowing it to be a win. And, and it's not, doesn't mean like snap of the fingers, it's all better. It's going to take a little time, but you're going to get to a moment where like gratitude, you're going to say, I, you know, I'm, I'm grateful for the 15 years of addiction and all that stuff. Like the, the man that it made me, it, like there's nothing else that could have done that. The, the two heartbreaks, the two heartbreaks absolutely prepared me for what I'm experiencing now in my relationship. Without those two heartbreaks, I would never be able to hold the woman that I have now and the relationship that I have now. Mm. But in the moment of when they're happening, you know, it's hard to have gratitude for them <laughs> in the moment because they're like, they feel like they're causing it, havoc and yeah. chaos in your life. Yeah. Gratitude's a funny one because everyone's like, you know, just, just be grateful for something. And I'm like, in the moment you're like, uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, and, and just honor that. Like that's part of it. That's part of the initiation is honoring that right now this absolutely fucking sucks. Like no, no, and there's nothing else to me to be said. Don't need to justify it. Put a reason behind it. It just fucking sucks right now. And be in that, allow that, allow that grief, allow that, allow that pain, allow <clears throat> crying yourself to sleep at night, allow, you know, sacred rage practices, allow it, allow all the suck to happen. And then you will get to the, the point where it's like, wow, that's exactly everything that, you know, I was praying for a lot of things in that moment, that break, that heartbreak or whatever it was was actually part of the prayer. It was actually part of the answered prayer. Mm. Yeah. And it's, um, it, it kind of hits me how this same way of initiation can be similar for, you know, like you might go on a, a six month program or you might be on a, on a week long expedition in the jungle. You might do a psychedelic journey, for instance, where there's moments when you're on this kind of precipice and you can feel the fear and you, you lean in or you could run away, you know, that the day you arrive at the ayahuasca retreat and they, you sit down with the shaman and he asks you a few <laughs> questions and you kind of get an inkling of what you're going to be in for. And you think you could easily go, Oh, fuck this. I'm going, I'm going, I'm fuck this. I'm, I'm, I'm running away. Yeah. And yeah. it's that same energy you, you mentioned before and we've kind of like gone into is like, ah, oh, I can lean into this. I can lean into this. I can feel this more. Like we can feel it more or I can do what I've habitually done. And what we've habitually done is run away yeah. from the challenge, run away from the expansion, run away from the deepening of love, run away from the, um, the expansion of, of vulnerability and openness that we may experience in relationship. Yeah. Yeah. I love that you brought the word deepening in because that's really like to, uh, to, to, to be able to meet yourself in in that depth is truly truly the most initiate the most initiatory thing um, that that can happen. You know when you're when you allow yourself to like whether it's an ayahuasca journey or a sleepless week in a heartbreak, like you're you're meeting yourself in a in a level of depth that you have not previously met yourself, and you're building trust, you're building, you're getting wisdom, you're freeing yourself. Um, all, all the things happen. I remember, um, the first time when I went to the jungle for the first time in 2021, 
I was there for three weeks, and I remember one of the weeks, this woman came in, and she sat one night, and then she she was on a boat the next morning, out of there, <laughs> and just and and just I saw what you were just talking about. She's like, uh, nope, I'm not ready for this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it's 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 true. It's like, and how willing are you to to interrupt the pattern? Mm, mm. How how willing are we to face the parts of ourselves that we dare not ever look at, or that we yeah that we made up were too scary, too hard, too too painful, whatever. And 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 the thing about it is, is like most of the time, all it takes is a look. You know, it's because we're looking, we're spending all this time like, oh. Uh, I'm looking away, you know, I don't want to see that. Yeah, you know, I did it with my addiction for post addiction for I was probably seven years in and I thought I was clear. I was like, I'm good. And then, you know, drop into a few plant medicine ceremonies and that version that I had essentially exiled. It wasn't that I was healed. I just exiled that version of me. That exiled version came back, was pounding on my door. I'm like, hey buddy, <laughs> still here, still need some love. And it felt a lot like I was back in it. Like I was going to be the addict again. And, and the thing that, the one thing that shifted was, okay, I opened the door and I let him in and I said, come on in, like, let's talk. What do you, what do you, what do you need right now? What do you need to say? And that's really like, that lifted all of it. You know, that, that was the real healing. That's the real, you know, the moment that I could say like, you know, talk about recovering, recovered, <clears throat> that moment of letting that version of me back in is the moment when it was actually like, ah, oh, I'm actually free of this now. Is it? Is that for you? Was that for you almost a way of um, bringing that part, that exiled part of you into your own heart and showing it the love that it, it really needed? Yeah. I mean, it, 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 the, the, whatever that version of me had to express, you know, what, whether it was so much guilt and so much shame, um, the shame has been a massive one for me. Shame, shame run ran so deep in me from basically a childhood of, you know, friends picking, like I would have an asthma attack at a birthday party instead of compassion. Kids don't really know compassion, but what they do know is like, that's different. Like let's, let's make fun of that or let's, and, and I experienced that. And, um, that shame, you know, 2009, that shame, and this then pile on the shame of addiction. In 2009, I jumped off a balcony at a bar, 35 feet, tried to commit suicide wow. because the shame was just running my show. Like, I'm, I'm done feeling this. Like, the only thing that would stop me from being shameful was drinking, which also then created more shame. And I, I recognized this, like, and this was all subconscious. Like, I was not aware. I was hammered drunk, and, I, and this happened. Um, and then 2022... Um, I had, I had mouth cancer in 2009 and 2011, I uh, had oral cancer and I got it surgically removed both times. And the doctors in about 2000, um, like 18, after seven years of checkups, they're like, you know, unless something massive happens here, you're in the clear. And then 2022, the spot where the cancer was in my mouth opened up and it was an open wound in my mouth. And, um, so I'm like, okay, I think this is what they were talking about. So I went to see two doctors and they said, yeah, that's, that's cancer. Yeah. Your cancer's back. Like, let's get a biopsy done. And, um, I went, I, I knew it wasn't going to be a Western medicine path. So, um, I, I committed to a lot of like Joe Dispenza meditations and Louise Hay stuff and getting into the, like, the German new medicine and the emotional connection to all of this and, uh, ended up in Costa Rica sitting with ayahuasca and the last night, um, it was shame. I was just, I was riddled with shame for four hours in an ayahuasca journey and came out of it and got the biopsy done two weeks later and the cancer was gone. Wow. And like, and just knowing that like that level of shame can exist in the body. I forgot exactly where I was going with that, but, um, it just like, this is the thing about, um, the, um, the, the emotional side of all of it, like these initiations, like we, like we, we attach a lot to like a, an external situation, whether that's the heartbreak, external addiction is pretty much external. Um, you know, cancer could be looked at as an external thing. Um, there's always the emotional connection to something there. And when we can, part of the initiation is um, digging and finding that emotion, that emotional connection. Mm. 
And then through that digging, there's an expanded emotional capacity that we have to feel what is present for us, feel our past, feel the things we haven't felt before, and then also to feel others as well, to be in deeper connection with the people yeah. we, we meet and come across. Yeah. And I mean, I think all of it really, like this uninitiated has just layers upon layers upon layers of dirt and muck on it over his heart. Mm -hmm. And so as we reveal, like, and what every woman wants is a heart-led man. That's it. Uh, a man that is li living from his heart. That is what the basis is what an initiated man is, and it's what every woman, every, every, every other human we come in contact with, whether it's man-woman, man-man, woman-woman, whatever. The, the thing that the person that's in front of us desires most is a heart, a feeling our heart. Mm. And the uninitiated has walls up and barbed wire and all the things and ice around the heart. As we, as we, we go through the initiation, these layers of our heart drop away and our heart opens up and it's scary to lead with an open heart is scary. And the more that we can hold ourselves in the, the opening without allowing ourselves to close off the, the more, the better life gets. Mm -hmm. and, and when you say heart centered there, right? Cause I know, I talk to my clients about this and they, when they think of they head, hear the words heart centered for me, they kind of think, ah, oh, you know, I'm just going to be like super soft and soppy and just feeling and just crying and just like mm -hmm. talking about my yeah. feelings all the time. I'm just going to follow what my whimsical emotions <laughs> and feelings want me to do. Like, how am I going to live like that? I'm not going to be a powerful yeah. man in that way, but the sense I'm getting from you, that's not the, that's yeah. not what you're expressing and what I know as heart led to be. No. Um, that, I mean, that could be part, there's moments for that and that's part of it, but it's like, I know exactly what you're saying is like, oh, so, you know, I'm going to be maybe super feminine or super, you know, not, not masculine. And, um, there's a, there's a couple of things about that. One is there's a, there's a quote from, uh, the gospel of Thomas is that, um, when you bring forth the medicine that is in your heart, it will, it will, uh, save you. If you do not bring forth the medicine on your heart, it will destroy you. And so as men, purpose is one of the biggest things for us. Like it is baked into our existence that purpose, honestly, it comes before the woman, it comes before the family, it comes before everything. And then when you do that, there is room for all the other things. But if a man is so dedicated, maybe the family is the purpose, but if a man is ignoring or uh, not honoring his purpose, the rest of the stuff will all fall away. And so when we talk about pur a purpose, it's a very heart-centered word. If you're in purpose, on purpose, being of purpose, you, you are inherently in your heart. And so when we talk about, like, yeah, like the heart, it does get to be emotional. And that's part of, part of being, a, you know, the divine masculine, initiated masculine is how in touch with your heart, the feelings, the, the, the emotions are you. How well are you able to hold those, express those, without bleeding on somebody, without dumping on somebody. And then uh, is your heart leading you to integrity, uh, to dignity, to authenticity? You know, it, 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 becomes, it becomes almost like when I think of heart, I think of like real solid, generous, open, big, just kind of penetrating the world, pumping, and just really being like this, like a force for good in the world. Mm. Mm, I mean, what... And also, there's like, and you said, there's a force. Is not this um, capitulation. There's not a um, just falling by the wayside. Because I think one of the things we're seeing more and more, and why this it just come to me is that what we're seeing more and more, I feel, is is men feeling scared of masculinity or anything that looks like masculinity. Right? We're seeing um, oh, yes men, and I even see this in myself of like, we see these masculine figures, they may be our fathers, they may be uh, men we see in celebrities and so forth. And we see the traits, their traits pulled apart and usually labeled as toxic. And I want, I've, I've been wondering myself is like, how is this affecting young men? Is it causing men to want to just move away from being seen as masculine at all costs? Because if I'm not masculine, I'm seen as safe. Yeah. yeah I that's uh i love this um it's so funny the collective you know the collective consciousness like how like one conversation pops up and then it just keeps happening like this has been a big one that i've been having for a few weeks um 
we are, I think, like with the Me Too movement and BLM and like the masculine got put in this, like, yes, very, very fucking dangerous. And a lot of men then recoiled the pendulum, swung in the other direction where it's like, I'm going to be really, really soft and really, really safe, but I'm also going to be kind of boring. And not really like, you know, we, we let's, I think one of the major kind of com- components of this is sexual energy. Men feel very predatory in their sexual energy. Like, because we've been told like, oh, you're, you're, a, you're a sexual predator. You're, you're a player. You are, you know, like all these things that are very leaky is a nice way to put it, sexual energy. And so as men, like, and I, I've, I've, this has been a massive evolution for me over the past three years, like coming out of addiction where I was super fucking leaky with my sexual energy to the point of hurt and destruction and pain. I, I, I bottled it up and locked it up so down, so locked down that I, it went in the other way and I was not, I mean, it was, it was just not expressed at all. And so now the, the, the work over the past couple of years for me has been, uh, re tapping into that primal, safe, expressive sexual aka creative energy um and, and being like how do how do you let that expression penetrate the world without being dangerous and you're right like we have a lot of programming to unlearn um that has been thrust upon us sometimes or taught to us or um society has just decided there's a lot of ways it can go and men definitely feel afraid to be sexual or to be um, even like uh, like men like flirting has become almost like towing that line of dangerous and, and predatory, and even then take that step further back. Like even being polite to a girl, like sometimes it can be like, "What are you doing? Like why are you holding the door for me? Like are you, you know, no, I have a boyfriend. You know, like there's there's like it it just it's such a there's so many little fine lines in there that and and men I think part of the initiation is learning um, how to safely express this energy that lives inside of us without being predatory, without being, feeling dangerous. Um, you know, I go into these big rooms with like co-ed rooms with 50, 60, 70, 80 people, half women, half men. And it's a room built on safety. And yet you see little things happening in the room where, you know, like there's one guy in the room or two guys in the room that like the women are kind of like avoiding, like, I don't feel safe around him. Um, other men, are you know the the women are like in the groups they're gravitating towards that because it feels safe <clears throat> and then talking to what you spoke to about um how safe is too safe mm-hmm. you know like safety safety is great but there's also a if you're not tapped into your your primal essence you're actually not safe like you may be uh mm, i don't know the word but you may, you may be not dangerous but that doesn't mean you're safe mm-hmm. You know, safe is this like this ability to know that you have this inside of you, this ability to fuck shit up inside of you. And Jordan Peterson talks about this. I think he says, "Be be uh, be a danger, but don't be dangerous." You know, and it's like, yeah, you should be able to a man like for his own good and for the people around him, and and like his own like confidence and the way he uh, penetrates the world and his woman and all these things should know that. Yeah, I, I have the capability to be very dangerous and I have it completely in check, completely under control. And that's what, and that, that's safe. That's what real safety is. But if you're being safe to the point of like, oh, I'm just, you know, I'm nice guy. This is why, you know, the, the No More Mr. Nice Guy, that book is so popular is because it speaks to this about how there is such a thing as too safe and it's, it's timid. It's, uh, it's, it's not a lot of confidence. It's, it's basically, um, a lot of suppression of the masculinity of the masculine expression, whatever that is. And that women pick up on that. And that's why, again, nice guys finish last because women are picking up on that. Like, Oh, you're nice. And you, you know, I don't feel threatened by you, but I also don't feel safe around you. Mm-hmm. It's like a disconnection from what you're describing. There is that men are disconnecting from an innate natural part of themselves to feel that they can fit into the world yes. and tick the boxes of what we are I don't want to say what we think a modern man should be because I think that's productive and simplistic, but it's almost like, oh, if I, if I suppress and, and tone down all those parts of me that I think the world will reject, the think the world thinks are dangerous, then everyone will, will accept mm-hmm. me. It's a bit like, like you said, the nice guy syndrome, right? Is that, oh, if I suppress all my wants and my needs and I just feel easy and nice, 
then she's going to love me, right? But what actually a lot of men don't realize yeah. is what the woman then feels from you is like, there's an inauthenticity there. Like you don't feel yourself. I don't feel safe with you. You think you occur as being safe because you're nice and you're gentle and you're kind and you speak softly, but actually you're unsafe because for one example is you allow people to cross your boundaries and you don't say anything about it. Someone crosses you, your partner crosses your boundaries and you're just like, oh, that's okay. And in that moment, she's like, well, I can feel you're <laughs> lying to me. So can I trust you? Are you trustable yeah. as a man in this moment? Yeah, yeah you might feel safe mm -hmm. and non-predatory, but a woman that has a deeper feeling, a deeper presence, a deeper intuition, she will pick up on the, the lack of trust that she can feel with you. And I've always wondered yeah. whether it's, you know, because there's this, in kind of contrast to this, there's the, the kind of archetype of the bad boy. And this kind of idea that, you know, women flock towards bad boys. And I spent a lot of time both thinking about myself and thinking about the men that I've known. There's an authenticity to bad boys, right? There's an authenticity because they are speaking their mind and their word. And sometimes it's pretty harsh, right? And sometimes they'll act in ways yeah. that can be kind of cruel and, and, and so forth. But there's a straightness often, not always, to their way of being that does make them magnetic because there's an honesty to it. Mm -hmm. and, and essentially there's, there's also a, uh, within that is a simplicity. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know what you're going to get with a guy that's kind of like says yes to everything. You're like, no, 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 what am I getting here? Like there's a, there's a bit of like wishy-washy in that. But as the bad boy is like, okay, that's, this is who I am. And it's simple and predictable and it's safe. It's like, take it or leave it. This is how I am. Take it or leave it. Yeah. Yeah. Massive, la massive level of I'm okay. And I, and you can come on over and then like, we'll, we're going to do magic together if, if we're both in this. And if you don't like have, there's someone else, there's something else, some other thing there for you. And there's some other thing there for mm. me. Yeah. I'm okay. You're okay. We can be okay together, but I'm also okay with you doing okay over there and me doing okay in my own way. Right? Yes. And that takes a lot of work to get to that point. <laughs> <laughs> and, and listeners, we're not saying that the bad boys of the world are spiritually enlightened because they can just be cool with themselves. We're just using this yeah. as, a, as a, an example, yeah. a teaching example that of, of kind of authenticity and truth and alignment to the moment right. even, you know? Um <laughs> What are, what are some of the, the kind of other, um, traits of an initiated masculine man? Um, that's a great question. Um, I, I feel, um, just going to heart dump some words here. Consciousness, mm -hmm. awareness, um, confidence, ability to hold space, like hold, um, yeah, unwavering presence, I think is a big one. <clears throat> and when you talk about presence, <clears throat> excuse me, um, Funny that my throat <laughs> locked up on that one. <laughs> um, you talk about presence. Like, so presence is what, like in a relationship, when you can be present, then, then that means that there's no hurt, there's no pain, there's no fear, there's no uninitiated versions of you running the show. Because the uninitiated version of you is going to want to pull away from the presence. Because presence is one of the most vulnerable things that we can you know, everyone says like the, the one gift, the most important gift you can give somebody is your presence, like being present with them. And it's also quite vulnerable. Um, it, it, it opens up everything. It's the open heart. I'm here with an open heart. Um, that's initiated. Uh, the other thing is how well do you carry a presence? Like when you walk into a room, you know, does your energy, does, do people know you're there? And this is not about saying like arrogant, I am here. Like it's not about, you know, that, that hyper dominant thing. It's just about knowing that your presence is felt and that, that can go into the home that can go into walking into Starbucks or walking into a party, whatever it is. Um, there's an element of okayness with an initiated man. You know, I am okay. I, I'm here. I'm okay. I see every, I see like, um, a lot of times uninitiated will, uh, create blinders because it's, there's a lot of survival mode in an uninitiated man. 
you know, and that looks a lot like narcissism. Sometimes it looks a lot like the toxicity. It looks a lot like addiction. Uh, it's blinders. And so as you become initiated, you take off the blinders and you kind of, it goes from like a, a, a state of vigilance to a state of loving awareness where it's all welcome. And this is, you know, in, in relationship to let the, to, to, to allow the other person or, and this is not just intimate relationship. This is like with a client, this is with a buddy, this is with a parent, this is with a stranger. How much does your energy allow all of them to be there without them trying to suppress or hold back or coddle or whatever it is? Um, a big part of the, un the initiated masculine is um, conscious loving awareness of all of it. And w within that is the ability to hold uh, all of it. Mm. Mm. And as you say that, I think of like a really beautiful therapist who you can go to and you can just unpack yourself or melt yourself in front of. And there's this mm -hmm. willingness to um, be with and observe and be there for without any judgment or out any um, kind of reaction of, of shaming or anything like that. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, that's, that's, you nailed it. You know, when we can release the, the judgment or even the, um, I'm listening to respond type energy, if we can really be there and be present and just listen. And a lot of guys, I talk to them and like when they're in you know, conflict, they want to interrupt and like, I gotta, I gotta say what I gotta say. I gotta, I gotta get my word in. I gotta get my, I gotta defend myself. Like, and it's like, uh, -uh. Just let her go and, and let her speak. And if, if, if what you have to say is still relevant when she's done, have at it. But you, have to, you get to be okay with that uh, calmness, that presence, without the, uh, the need to judge, cover up, defend, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And that itself is in a relationship or any interaction can be incredibly healing for somebody who's never been, never received anyone or had anyone receive them in that way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. To, to meet someone in, uh, in all of them is really, really powerful. Mm. Mm. That feels, uh, as I, as we get there, I was like, that feels like a really, that feels like a lovely place to, to just round off just because <laughs> is that's the thing that we yeah. get is when we are initiated in the, 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 the big initiations and the many little ones, we both bring our own wholeness, but we then also create spaces that we allow other people to bring their wholeness to or in our presence. And again, it's like the, um, it's kind of an analogy I said earlier. It's like, it's like the ink in the water, you know, we bring our, we bring our wholeness. We allow the people and it just diffuses and spreads out to the many people that we meet, the many people that we work with, the, our families, our friends, mm -hmm. our coworkers, the stranger in Starbucks, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's an, it's an energetic signature that we carry. Yeah. And, it, and that's the, I was reading a quote today. Um, my therapist actually sent me some, some text to read. And one of it was that, um, it's a, the whole saying is, is reasonably long, but it's pretty much is that a man was thinking that, you know, when he was young, he was like, oh, I'm going to go and change the world. And then, you know, he started off by trying to change his, his town, his city and country and so forth. And as he got older, he realized that really the place he should start to try and make the changes in, in himself. And then he can make the changes to the, the, the family, the town, the village and the world. Yeah. It's, it's, there's so much truth in that. <laughs> mm. Beautiful. It's kind of, it reminds me of, uh, you know, the Rainmaker, by, the story by Carl Jung. Mm. Yeah, where the Chinese guy goes to the village that's having the drought and he goes into the tent on, in the village for four days and like, and then all of a sudden on the fourth day, a massive snowfall comes and the drought's over. And he said, yeah, I had to, I had to go, I had to come into this. I was in alignment. I came into your village that was out of alignment. I got out of alignment and I brought it all back to alignment um, to, to, to bring the drought to an end. Yeah, no, that's powerful. 
same 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 concept there yeah and so we do for ourselves ah well man what a conversation what a what the time just flies by um and i imagine the listeners yeah. sam the, the they've listened to your beautiful wisdom and experiences and they're wondering you know where they where can they hear more of you where can they come and work with you mm-hmm. i'd love you to tell the, the listeners all that yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. First of all, I want to say thank thank you for um, the work you do in the world. It's it's super inspiring. It's super needed, um, and it's it's beautiful the way you show up. So thank you for that. Thank you. Um, thank you for creating this space, uh, this this energetic space, this space that we get to come in and have these conversations. Um, if it, it's so amazing, and I just you know, we both know the world needs more of this. Mm. <laughs> so, thank you. Um, you can find me. Instagram is the best way to find me. Uh, the handle is at Sam Gibbs Morris. That's G I B B S Sam Gibbs Morris. And then everything else, the, the website link, the, the booking links and all that stuff's on there. Beautiful. Beautiful. Ah, well, listeners, thank you for being present to this wonderfully weaving conversation. Um, and we just dived into all these different areas of just what's, what's really permanent, per- pertinent to men and what's they're experiencing. Um, and if you've enjoyed this episode, send it to a man, send it to a man, you know, you know, I know there's a lot of women listening to the podcast as well. So, and ladies, I, I want to just yeah. salute you for first of all, listening and also for the number of men that come to me and go, Hey, I heard about you through my girlfriend, through my ex-girlfriend, through this girl that I'm, I, I'm friends with. Yeah. <laughs> so I want to salute you ladies. Thank you very much. Um, but yeah, move yeah. forward. Can I take you back yeah, on that? Man. Yeah, uh, I love that you. I love that you brought that in because it, it's so true. That uh, I want to just thank all the women out there because I feel like women are the tip of the spear of this growth, this expansion, this inviting us into our initiations. Um, and you, the same as you, like yeah, I heard about you through my ex girlfriend, or I heard about you through my sister, or whatever it was. And it just the women that are doing this work and and leading in that way is so great. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah, it's really. Um... I've come to this realization years ago and it's, it's, I think it was during my degree, I did a degree in computer science and I was talking to someone who was studying history and he said to me how um, we were talking about, uh, he was writing an essay about social change. And I remember him saying to me, he's like, you know, every social change was pretty much led by women. He's like, most of them, not all of them, but pretty much every social change, yeah. there's a good proportion of them that are led by women. And it, it it's kind of crept back into my consciousness re- recently. It's like, shit, relational change, right? The evolution of relationships is almost always led by, by women, by the feminine. Mm. So beautiful. That That really, like, my heart is like, just like in my throat just it's just that knowing like when you point that out like i hadn't thought about that but yeah wow mm. no it's powerful well thank you listeners thank you for listening um thank you sam and this is ciao ciao until next week i want to say a big thank you for listening you know it's people like yourself that really help get the podcast out into the world you know, especially if you're often sharing the episodes and the podcast with people that you, th- you feel just could do of listening, right? Can see a different way of being a man, maybe a different way of having dating lives and intimacy and relationships. So I want to say a big thank you. And if maybe after listening to this episode, you think, oh, there's someone actually you could really do with this, please share it with them, you know, share the love. I'm really, really grateful. And if, you know, you want to get in contact with me for any questions, or you want to talk about coaching or any working together, feel free to reach out to me on Instagram at theauthenticman underscore, or you can email me hello at theauthenticman.net. Thank you very much.